right, so today I, I was thinking, you know, I, it's really tough preaching on holidays because you're kind of boxed in a little bit. So, okay, I want to talk about a mom, and we did the Proverbs 31 woman for two different years, and we've talked about Esther, and we talked about a bunch, and I said, you know what? Let me look up a mom that probably many people have never heard of. And that kind of really fits in with the theme today. So today we're talking about Jochebed. Jochebed, the trust of a godly mother. That's what we're going to talk about today. But um, here's a true story. Uh, there was a father and his five-year-old son. And the, and the five-year-old was just really getting into that stage of just being curious about everything. And, and the boy, he found the parents' wedding album. So as mom was in the kitchen doing the mom thing, getting dinner ready, setting the table, and, and all of the things that moms do, of course, the husband's sitting on the couch, and the five-year-old brings the photo album of, of the wedding ceremony up to him, and they're looking through, and okay, here's, here's mommy, and you know she's getting ready, and here's all of her bridesmaids, and here's mommy walking down the aisle, and then it came to that picture of the moment where the husband is sliding the ring onto her finger. And the five-year-old stopped and said, Dad, is that when mom came to work for us? <laughs> Obviously, the picture that was painted to that five-year-old was mom's always working. And that's, is that kind of... Does that track, ladies? Yeah, that, I just, just got a, this roaring amen right there. I mean, that, that should have been. So, um, so anyway, there, there's, there's, okay, that, okay, that wasn't a true story, but this really is a true story. There was a CEO, like this really high status, very well-to-do guy and his wife, and they were going on vacation. And they were, they were driving off, and a few hours later, they, they stop at a convenience store. And they walk in, they have to get some gas, and they're getting some snacks for the trip. And all of a sudden, this, this husband, he hears, oh my goodness, I can't believe it's you. Oh, Paul, how long has it been? And she goes up to the clerk of the gas station, and she gives him like the biggest hug, like, like is she ever going to let him go? And like, oh, they're catching up about old times. And this, this husband's kind of standing there going, what in the world is going on? And She's just going on and on and on. Oh, you know, it's been so long. You know, I've missed you. Da, 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 da. And so she finishes, and they walk out of the store, and this husband, you know, he's like, he's like this really important guy. He thinks he's, he's, he didn't know something about his wife's life. He was like, um, excuse me, who is that? And she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. That was Paul. I should have introduced you. Uh, Paul and I dated for a really long time back in high school, and I was in love with Paul. Like, I mean, I, I really thought it was going to work out. It, it didn't work out, but, you know, that, 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 that was Paul. And, it, you know, this, this big-time CEO and all of his insecurity and everything, he's, he's kind of thinking about it, and, and he goes, hmm, well, just think. You could be married to a gas station attendant. And she says, oh no, honey. If I would have married him, he would have been the CEO. <laughs> oh, that one gets applause. <laughs> All right. I think it's safe to say that more often than not, the strong, godly women that are in our lives are just so important to us men. Right, men? There you go. That, that, we call that a lob, okay? And so you take those opportunities when you can. But ladies, we want to honor you today. We, we really want to just honor you and love on you and tell you how important you are in our lives. And uh, that, that old saying, behind every good man, there's a good woman, that is so true. Men, amen? amen. Okay. You got it. All right. So we've got a key statement for today, as we normally do. If there's one thing that I want you guys to remember from the day, it's our key statement. This is it. Fully trusting God and acting upon that trust guarantees a life of greatness and blessing. I want to read that one more time. Fully trusting God, and then because we say that we trust God oftentimes, but until we act upon that trust, that's what guarantees us a life of greatness and blessing. Now, a little disclaimer here, 
what you think, it, and, and you, if you're new here, if you're not used to my, my preaching, you might be going, oh great, we wandered into one of those prosperity gospel churches. No, not at all. Let me explain. Your idea of greatness and blessing is probably extremely different from God's idea of greatness and blessing. But, but when you really dig down to it, whose do you really think is better? Our idea of greatness and blessing or God's idea? God's. Absolutely. So, fully trusting God and acting upon that trust guarantees a life of greatness and blessing. Now, again, I, I want us to look at a woman in the Bible today that you've probably never heard of, but she has great significance in the history of God's people. Now, she's barely named in the Bible. I think she's only named two times in all of Scripture, and she's hardly uh, mentioned, which, again, is typical uh, of women sometimes. They're overworked and what? Underpaid, absolutely. So her name was Jochebed. Jochebed. Raise your hand. Who's, tell me, who's heard of Jochebed from the Bible? Okay, just a handful of us here. Um, it's pretty interesting. Her name means Yahweh is glory. And, and what I didn't know, I found out this week as I was researching, she was the first person in scripture to have a name with a divine meaning. Before that, there wasn't anybody, and then we came to Jacobed, or in Hebrew, you probably would have said Yahaved. That's how you would have pronounced it. Yahweh is glory. So in Exodus chapter 26, verse 59, you can, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 1. I just want to read one verse in Exodus 26, and this is one of the two places that actually gives us her name. In Exodus 26, verse 59, it says, The name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, a descendant of Levi, who was born to the Levites in Egypt. To Amram, she bore, and here's who she is, she bore Aaron, Moses, and their sister Miriam. So now we would say, if we're describing her, we probably wouldn't say uh, Aaron and Miriam. We would probably say Jochebed is the mother of Moses. So if you guys remember the history of the nation of Israel, we've got Jacob. He had 12 sons. One of those sons was sold off into slavery in Egypt. What was his name? Joseph, okay, and then Joseph kind of, you know, bad things happen for a while, and then he kind of rises up in the ranks, becomes number two in all of Egypt, uh, and then uh, makes favor with Pharaoh. He moves uh, all of Jacob and his family, about 70 or so people, into Egypt. Things are going perfectly well, and they live happily ever after in Egypt, right? Eh, for a while, things are good until the Pharaoh, a new Pharaoh, realized, oh my goodness, these Hebrews are, are becoming way too many. They're, they're going to overtake us, so then they put them into forced slavery. And that's where we're going to pick up Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 6. I just want to, in chapter 1, we're just setting the stage of what's going to happen. Chapter 2 is our, our key verses. So Exodus 1, verse 6, it says, Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. Verse 14, they made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua. You thought Pua was the pig in Moana, but nope, you were wrong. When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, 
If you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. What an awesome mantra of a life is no matter what was going on around them, they feared and obeyed God. What would it look like if we only feared and obeyed God? Would our lives be any different than they are now? Would we have maybe not made some of the terrible mistakes that we've made in the past if we only feared and obeyed God? What would it look like? I wrote this down. What would it look like if we fully trusted God and left the outcome of our difficult circumstances up to him? Things would look different. So again, our key statement, fully trusting God and acting upon that trust guarantees a life of greatness and blessing. Remember, God's version of greatness and blessing, not ours. Verse 18. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. Now, there's a whole lot. I mean, we could spend a lot of time in here. Basically, what they were doing is they were making an excuse. They were saying, listen, Egyptian women... Uh, they're a little bit, you know, kind of wimpy. Hebrew women, man, they're like, oh, the baby's coming. <laughs> Bomb, done, okay? Move on. That's what they're kind of saying. And, and they're like, no, the Egyptians, they take their time. And they're, uh. She's like, no way. This just happens before we get there and the babies are born already and we can't do anything about it. So they're making an excuse to Pharaoh. Verse 20. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Imagine a government-sponsored effort to kill thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of babies. Unfortunately, we live in a time where that's happening. A little bit later on today, you're gonna hear about a, a women's pregnancy center that we support. We're gonna today start the baby bottle boomerang and it takes women who are in crisis pregnancies and walks them through that, speaks Jesus into their lives. Don't wanna get too ahead of myself, but imagine that. Church, we need to be the church in this. We talked about this a couple of months ago, but we need to rise up as the church and speak, and speak on behalf of those who cannot speak. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. Enter Jochebed. Now, again, here is the main story about her, and she's not even named. How typical. She does all the work and doesn't even really get much of the recognition, does she? It says, when she saw that he was a fine child. This is very interesting right here. This has a lot more meaning than when we were to just read it as we do in English, if you were to look at it in Hebrew and break it down and then as well compare it with other verses confirmed in Hebrews 11 that we'll look at here in a little bit, there's so much more to this. What this is saying is when, when she bore him, when she had him, she looked at him and it was almost like God gave her a vision for him. God spoke to her to Jochebed that, listen, this baby is special. Now, don't get me wrong. Every baby is special. But it was like God told her, no, no, no. I have a humongous plan for him. You need to protect him at all costs. That's what this means when it says when she saw that he was a fine child, there was something different about him that God had a plan. So this leads us to 
our first observation. We've got five observations today. You may want to write these down, but just looking at Jacobed, looking at godly mothers, just thinking about what moms who were fully focused on God, but fully just engulfed in raising godly children. Our first observation is godly mothers have a vision for their children. Godly mothers have a vision for their children. They, moms, they have this intuition to see potential, oftentimes when nobody else does. Or moms, they, they kind of speak what could be and what should be into their children's lives. You think that makes a difference? Yeah, it absolutely does. When a mom just loves her child through everything and just speaks that future, that vision into their lives, it changes things. Moms are just, there's just something about moms. There's, there's even a saying, he has a face that what? Only a mother could love, right? It's like moms, moms are all in no matter what. Like ugly baby, it doesn't matter. I love this baby. This is the most beautiful baby ever. Okay, there's no such thing as an ugly baby, okay? <laughs> Godly mothers have a vision for their children. They know what could be and they know what should be of their children. So it says, when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him. For three months. Wow. She hid him for three months. Our second point here is godly mothers protect their children at all costs. They protect their kids. You've seen that before? Woo. Watch out. Now, if Pharaoh was willing to kill thousands of Hebrew babies, do you think he was willing to kill one adult that was disobeying? Absolutely. This was Jochebed's life on the line, and she didn't care. Now, obviously, guys and everybody else who's not a mom or not a mom anymore or not a mom yet, this applies to all of us. Yes, we are speaking at mothers today, but we need to have vision for our children. We need to have vision for God's plans in our lives. We need to protect the things that God has placed in our lives. This applies to every single one of us. The godly mothers protect their children at all costs. Um, one of the most powerful, most productive, most dangerous forces on the planet. You know what that is? A mama bear. You watch out. You may as well go out into the woods and attack a real mama bear. Because if you get a mama on your bad side, watch out. Because godly mothers protect their children at all costs. Verse 3. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Here's another point. Godly mothers use what they have to propel their kids into destiny. Godly mothers use what they have to propel, I'm, I'm sorry, godly mothers have enough courage to trust God, no matter what, I'm getting ahead of myself here. They have enough courage. When she could hide him no longer, she's like, uh, we've had too many close calls, like the, the Egyptian soldiers and the guards, they were walking by, uh, like, like he was crying and I like, kind of had to muffle him a little bit. When she realized three months, this is not going to work out. I have to trust God. I, I got to have the courage that just, I don't know what's going to happen. But godly mothers have enough courage to trust God no matter what. Again, we asked the question earlier, what would it look like if we just trusted God above everything else? Our next point, but you got it already. Godly mothers use what they have to propel their kids into their destiny. They use whatever they have. Now, I, I know oftentimes, moms, you are under-resourced. You need more time, all of the above. But godly mothers use what they have to propel their kids 
into their destiny. It says she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. You know what papyrus is? I used to have a bunch of it in my yard. It's called papyrus reed. It's this uh, round shoots and they get about this high. She wove this thing and made a basket and then coated it so it would be buoyant and stay in the water. She didn't have a whole lot. She, did, she couldn't put him on a train and send him somewhere where he would be safe. She, didn't, she was like, this is the only thing that I can do. God, I'm fully giving him into your hands. Godly mothers use what they have to propel their kids into their destiny. The next one, godly mothers do all they can, uh, all they can do and leave the rest up to God. Godly mothers, they, they do everything that they can do. Like when, when you've run out of options, it's like, God, I give it to you. Sometimes we have to do that with our kids. Sometimes we have to do that with the things that are important in our lives. It, it, the, the, the text doesn't say this. But I, I just, I, wanna, I want us all to stand in Jacobed's shoes for just a moment. Can you imagine the moment that she last saw her baby? The moment that she was giving him up and basically just giving him to God. Imagine how that felt. Imagine the pain, the hurt inside of her, that gut-wrenching feeling. And again, the text doesn't say this, but I bet she prayed a prayer, and I bet it was something like this. God... I've done all I can. I put him in your hands. I can no longer handle this on my own. What a great prayer. God, I, I've done everything that I can. God, I, I don't know what else to do. God, I'm, I'm fully giving this to you, and I know I can't take it back. I fully trust you, God, to do what only you can do. What a great attitude. What an amazing way to see things. Amongst the most hurt and pain she's probably ever felt in her life, yes, probably so. But that was probably her prayer. Now watch this. Godly mothers do all they can do and leave the rest up to God. Verse 4. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. Interesting. It's our last point here. Godly mothers plan for the future. Godly mothers, they plan for the future. M moms are always thinking ahead, aren't they? they? They usually don't just let the day come and, oh, I wonder what's going to happen today. Godly mothers, man, they're, they're planning ahead. They're, they're thinking, they're playing chess in their minds all the time, thinking a few moves ahead just in case. That's what godly moms do. Now, where do I get this from? I don't think that Miriam, Moses' sister, I don't know, text doesn't say how old she was at this time, but I don't think that she did this on her own. I don't think she went and, and hid to see what would happen, and then had this amazing... I, I, don't, I don't think that was just an accident. I think that was a godly mother who was just putting everything in God's hands, planning, wanting to know what was happening to her baby, probably a lot of prompting from God in this. But also I believe that Jacobed knew where the princess would be. I bet Jacobed knew kind of the princess's schedule and maybe this was a setup. Again, the text doesn't tell us that. But now here's something interesting. I always pictured, and, and maybe you did too, I always pictured this basket floating down the river. Is that how you pictured it? Like she, she, you know, she kind of made this basket, put him in, and kind of sent it out, and it floated down the river, and it ended up, or they saw it there. That's not what the text says. It says that Miriam put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. She just basically set it right there 
where we would see like cattails or reeds like on a river or on a canal right there. That's where she put it and left it there. Verse 6. So it says, she opened it, that's Pharaoh's daughter, uh, and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Now watch what Miriam does. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Well, that's just awesome timing, isn't it? Probably planned out. Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. Okay, she fully trusted God. She not only sort of, for a while here, gets her baby back, gets to nurse him, gets to keep him. And, and back then they would nurse children from about three to five years. So she got to keep Moses for a long time. And here's a really cool part of it. She got paid to do it. That was pretty cool. Just a little, the, one of those little God things. Like here's, here's a little extra blessing just because you trusted me. Verse 10, our last verse. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water, which Moses means to come out or to draw out. Interesting story. Jacobed faithfully fulfilled God's plan and purpose for her life, even though, now watch this, Jacobed did exactly what God wanted her to do, even though she lived in a culture of slavery, injustice, poverty, and fear. She was still, I mean, like, all of the odds were against her. Like, Pharaoh is killing babies. Her life is on the line. She was just a slave. People had their orders to do. She had no resources. Nevertheless, she fully trusted and obeyed God, and God rewarded her. God did amazing things through that. And, and I know maybe you kind of feel like Jacobet. Maybe you feel like, I, I, I just don't have the resources I need, like I just can't do it anymore. I know it's difficult. I know you don't have the resources. I know this is not how you planned it. I know there's not enough minutes in the day to accomplish everything that you want to do and the laundry is piling up and the sink is full of dishes and all of the above. I get that. But you can do it. Not, maybe not the dishes, maybe not the laundry, but you can fully trust and obey God no matter what. You could fulfill his purpose in your life of being a godly mother. So here's a question. Here's where it gets real. In what area of your life are you not fully trusting God and need to surrender to him? What area of life is it that you are not fully trusting God, that you, 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 just, you just can't seem to let it go and give it to God? In what area of your life are you not fully trusting God and need to surrender to him? Remember our key statement, fully trusting God and acting upon that trust guarantees a life of greatness and blessing. Guarantees God's version of greatness and blessing. Now, so you may ask, what life of greatness and blessing did Jacobed receive? Because like, okay, she got to have her baby back for a little bit, but then she had to give him up again. Well, I'll give you two reasons. Number one, she raised three amazing children that led God's chosen nation to freedom. That's what Jacobet did. That's, that's pretty awesome. Like, she is the mom that can be accredited to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, who were the three leaders, basically, that led 
the nation of Israel out of slavery into the promised land. Or at least to the promised land. So that was number one. And the second answer of what greatness and blessing did she receive? The second answer is found in the faith chapter of Hebrews. Just turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. Hebrews 11, like I said, it's known as the faith chapter or the hall of faith. And Hebrews 11 just names all of these godly people who, who even in the toughest of circumstances, they stayed faithful to God. Hebrews 11, verse 23, it says, By faith, Moses' parents, she doesn't even get named again. Talk about shortchanged, huh? But she's getting credit for it. By faith. Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child. There's that thing, that, that vision that she had for his life. Because she saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. <laughs> Jochebed made it to the hall of faith chapter because of the faith and the trust that she had in God. Fully trusting God and acting upon that trust guarantees a life of greatness and blessing. So again, the question is, in what area of your life are you not fully trusting God and need to surrender to him? Ladies, moms, I want to encourage you this morning. I, I, I want to speak some, some love into your hearts. Because I know it's difficult. Well, I don't know it's difficult. I can see that it's difficult. I have no clue. You ladies and you moms do in many ways way, way more than we men do. And you are overworked. And you are underpaid. And you are very underappreciated. But you deserve so much honor. And I want to encourage you, you can do it. Because God will give you strength. God will give you courage. Put your full faith and trust in God and he will carry you through. Whatever it is that you are just still holding on to, give it to God. And you will see that he will do only what he can do. Let's pray. Jesus, we just come before you this morning. So grateful and thankful for mothers, for the women in our lives who have played such a huge role. God, thank you that those moms and those women lifted us up when we were down. Thank you that they stepped in on our behalf. Thank you that they believed us and believed in us when no one else did. God, we honor them this morning. God, would you bless them? Give them courage, Lord. Give them strength. Give them more minutes in their day. God, we can't help but think as we look at mothers that we have an amazing heavenly father who believes in us even when he probably shouldn't. Who loves us more than we deserve. Who trusts us more than we even trust ourselves sometimes. Thank you, God, that you are a heavenly father that loves us enough to send your son to die for us. God, if there is someone in this room this morning who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who has not put their full faith and trust in you, has not started a relationship with you right now in this moment, God, would they say today is the day? I believe in your son, Jesus. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. God, watch over our moms, bless them, encourage them, speak into their hearts. 
thank you for them. And God, we lift up this time of offering that you would do something amazing. God, help us to be generous. Help us to show love. We pray all of this in your awesome, amazing, wonderful, beautiful name. Amen. Amen.